Police emergency. Hi, I want the top and daughter is missing, please. Right, how old is she? Nine. Nine? Yeah. When did you last see her? She went to school this morning. Right, have there been any argument or anything? No, like not that? at all. No. Have, have you been in touch with any of her friends or anybody like that? I've been that? everywhere I can think of, her right. friends, wives and family and everything. And nobody at all? No. Has any information or where she can be? No. But does she go to school and come back on her own normally then? Yes. Right. So, you were expecting her own what, at four o'clock then? About, about half a seat later, she's come right. back from school, she needs to work three. Does she have a mobile phone or anything like that? No, it's at home. Just, right, so she, there's no way of actually ringing to no. find out. But you've rung around all her friends yeah. and you've been in touch with all her relatives. Yeah. And there's nowhere else that you've got left to look. No. Have you been in touch with the school? Or, 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 can they confirm whether she's been? She went to school at normal time at 10 past three. Right. What the caller? Shannon Matthews. Has she been missing before? No. Hey guys, Craig here and welcome back to my YouTube channel. So on February 19th, 2008, Karen Matthews' life changed forever. What you just heard was a desperate mother's call to the police after her daughter didn't return home from a swimming lesson. She had checked frantically everywhere for her daughter, but no one had seen or heard from her since she left the bus. Shannon Matthews was only nine years old at the time and didn't have a cell phone to contact her mother in any way. What followed was arguably one of the largest manhunts since the Yorkshire Ripper. I can't say that it was a happy ending, but I can't necessarily say that it was tragic either. But I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here, so let's go back to the beginning. Karen Matthews grew up in a relatively stable household. And she was always, well, a little bit odd. Her parents were not exactly, well, what you would call good parents at expressing their love. Later in life, Karen would be described as not quite understanding the social norms. Despite this, she is what you would consider a functioning adult. She gave birth to seven children in total from five different fathers, one of her youngest being Shannon. But the names and ages of all of her children are hidden from public records to hide their privacy. Karen wasn't exactly the best mother, but she wasn't on the radar of the child protection agencies either. From the outside, Shannon looked clean and fed, and she attended school regularly. She also participated in after-school activities. There was never any reports or any sign of abuse. So when she disappeared, the family was quick to say that there was no way Shannon would have left on her own accord. She was a happy nine-year-old who had no reason to run away. And the police accepted this and started an investigation into a kidnapping. Anybody that has heard of a child abduction knows that the police believe that it's critical to find the child within the first 48 hours because the chances of them still being alive after this are slim. This meant that the West Yorkshire Police Department showed up in full force. With over 60 detectives, 250 officers and 16 out of the 27 UK police dogs they even teamed up with 200 volunteers from the British public. They combed through lakes and woods and searched over 3,000 homes and 1,500 motorhomes over the next two weeks. The community came together and rallied around Karen and her family to support her in the effort to find Shannon. They would even go as far as to print t-shirts post flyers and create a whole website dedicated to finding the missing nine-year-old. To say that the community support was overwhelming was an understatement. The police released the following information to be broadcast across British TVs and printed in the newspapers. Shannon was last seen after a trip to the Dewsbury Sports Centre after school. She had gone swimming there and took the coach back to the school with her friend Megan. Shannon told Megan that her mother and one of her brothers would be coming to pick her up. But this in itself was not unusual. But when they pulled up to the school, no one was there to collect Shannon. One of her siblings was always waiting by the gates when they arrived. 
so Shanna decided to walk home on her own. But that was the last time that anybody saw Shannon Matthews. Megan had given many interviews and testimonies since then, wishing that she hadn't let her friend go home alone. If they would have stayed together, then maybe the outcome would have been different. Of course, she would later learn that if Shannon had not been abducted that day, her captor would have waited for another opportunity. Michael Donovan was from the Dewsbury area, but there's not much information out there on his life before Shannon. If he had ever got into trouble with the law, it was never publicised. There were a few reports that stated his IQ was less than half of the average person and that he spent most of his life going to work and then going home. By all accounts, he would have lived and died without leaving any impression on the world. If only he had not made the decision to kidnap a bright young girl. He grabbed Shannon on her way home and took her back to his flat. He did not live too far away from Shannon's school or her home, and she tended to take the same path home every single day. He drugged Shannon as soon as he got her into the car, dosing her with temazepam. This is a drug that is meant to treat insomnia and had to be prescribed to him by a doctor. It is unclear if he had a prescription or not, or did he obtain the drug illegally. Michael then brought Shannon back to his flat that he had adapted to holding a child captive. He owned a double divan bed, which was hollow underneath the mattress. He pried off one of the ends and outfitted it so that he could take it on and off and replace it as often as he needed to. Additionally, he hung a noose from the ceiling near the bathroom. He'd done this to put around Shannon's waist. This way, if he went out, she could still use the bathroom or travel to a few other rooms in the house, but she could not get out of the front door. And lastly, he had come up with a list of rules that he wrote on a piece of paper for Shannon to memorise. The list was as followed. You must not make any noise or bang your feet. You must never go near the windows. You must not get anything or do anything without me being here. And you must keep the TV volume below 8. You can play Super Mario games as long as the volume is kept low. And you can listen to the CD player if you choose. This list of rules in general is very odd for a child abduction. But the last one especially sticks out. He is allowing Shannon to play with video games and watch TV, trusting that she will follow the rules and no one will know where she has gone. In order to keep Shannon compliant, he kept her drugged as well as keeping her locked under his divan bed. She was not allowed to have free reign of the flat. She could not leave and she could not free herself even if she tried. So meanwhile, the search for Shannon was still in full swing. As days turned into weeks, no one gave up hope. And Karen was especially helpful at trying to keep the attention on Shannon's case. She appeared numerous times on news channels, pleading with whoever took Shannon to just please let her go, with no questions asked. On more than one occasion, she chose to appear on TV despite the police telling her not to, that they would handle all communication with the press. Karen, desperate for her daughter's return, would not accept this and appeared on TV anyway, clutching a teddy bear, nearly in tears. And alongside her was her boyfriend and Shannon's stepfather, Craig. They shared stories of Shannon's younger sister who had become inconsolable without her. The two girls slept in the same room and now the younger of the pair refused to sleep and couldn't stop crying. Karen gave her daughter one of Shannon's bears for the young child to hold, hoping that this would calm her. It was this same teddy bear that she was now holding on TV. In addition to the mother's pleas, local agencies became invested in the safe return of Shannon. At 
first, the Sun newspaper offered £20,000 of a reward for anyone that came forward with any information leading to a break in the case. This number jumped quickly to £50,000 and a few other local organisations chipped in. Everyone around the Matthews family wanted to find some way to support them through this trying time. Finally, on March 14th, 24 days after her disappearance, the police got a tip. A concerned woman reported that her upstairs neighbour may be a potential suspect. She says that she has been hearing tiny footsteps, but did not believe that he had any children. What's more is that she would often hear those footsteps when she believed no one to be home. So the police headed for the address with everybody holding their breath, hoping for what seemed to be the impossible. They broke down the door of Michael Donovan while he was still sitting inside. But there was no sign of Shannon. They quickly handcuffed him, asking him what he knew about her disappearance. Asking where Shannon was. And tension soon started to run high. The police believing that maybe it was a false tip or that they were too late to save Shannon. Then an officer went to the bedroom and yelled to the rest that they might have found something. He popped off the end of the divan bed frame to reveal an unconscious Shannon, curled up and covered in a thin blanket. They quickly pulled her out, waking her up in the process. As she was escorted outside, she clung to the officer's leg, still groggy and petrified. Michael was arrested and charged with kidnapping and false imprisonment. He was convicted and sentenced to eight years in prison. But why did he do it? Was he a child molester? Did he happen to see Shannon on the side of the road and decide to take advantage of her? Why did their lives cross? Well, you might be surprised to know that Michael Donovan was actually Craig Meekin's uncle. Yes, Shannon Matthews' stepfather's uncle. Does this mean that Craig had conspired with his uncle to kidnap her? No. And the fact that the truth is remarkably more shocking than you may think. Karen Matthews, Shannon's mother, was planning on leaving Craig and was arranging her affairs so that she could move in with none other than Michael himself. At that moment though, Karen was low on money. She had seven kids to support, plus herself, and a move of house would be expensive. Remember when I says that there was a £50,000 reward? Well, that was Michael's motivation for kidnapping Shannon. After the reward money had been raised to a certain point, he was going to walk into the police station and say that he calmly found Shannon roaming in the woods. Michael was not the type of man that could have planned this all by himself. And some sources would argue that he was just a puppet. Not the mastermind of it all. After being arrested and questioned, he revealed that he was not alone in the plot and had been working with someone else. And he finally gave the police a name and it shocked the public. Karen Matthews orchestrated the kidnapping of her own nine-year-old daughter and was subsequently charged with child neglect and perverting the course of justice on April 8th. So while the public was surprised to hear this news, many were not. Among those who did not gasp in shock was Natalie Murray, Karen's friend and neighbour. Natalie had visited Karen on many occasions both before and after the disappearance. She knew that Karen could be a bit odd at times, but that did not prepare her for the woman that came out while Shannon was missing. Natalie describes Karen as being a Jekyll and Hyde type character. When she was in the house, she was joyous and cleaning and participating in fun activities. It seemed as though her life had in no way changed after losing her child. 
However, when the cameras came out, she was a sobbing, heartbroken mess. According to Natalie, she suspected something was up with the way that Karen would refer to Shannon as her princess. Karen had never used this type of loving language before and combined with the way that she acted when the camera was off, she knew that something was up. She also talked about another incident where Karen came down the stairs with a teddy bear right before the media got there. Natalie innocently asked if the bear was Shannon's and Karen replied, how am I supposed to know? That's right, her sob story on live TV about the teddy bear and how much the younger sibling missed Shannon was all a lie. Fabricated and made up to give Karen all the attention that she possibly needed. When Natalie felt that her doubts were valid, she decided to confront Karen. And instead of a confession, she got thrown out of the house and screamed at. She took this as an omniscience of guilt and went straight to the police. Natalie roped in another friend who was still speaking to Karen. The two of them decided to set up a sting operation along with the police. They called Karen and asked her to meet them out front with the police. When she arrived, no one beat her in the bush. They asked Karen point blank if she was involved in her daughter's kidnapping. And she gave up and confessed straight away. She confirmed what Michael had said about needing the reward money to move house. And she was quickly arrested. She was convicted of the charges mentioned earlier and also sentenced to eight years in prison. With Karen in jail, the state had to determine whose custody to put the children into. Karen's parents were too old to take care of any of the children and Craig was also not an option. Why? Because during the investigation, police had searched his computer. On it, they found large amounts of kiddie porn. So he was also arrested, even though he didn't have anything to do with Shannon's disappearance. This charge also puts Craig on today's list of bad guys for the episode. There were at least four children in that house, and it's sickening to think that they had a paedophile for a stepfather. Shannon and her siblings were then placed into protective custody and put into the foster care system. They were all given new names and separated from each other, and no one knows of their whereabouts today. Legally, anyone that did have any information wouldn't be allowed to share it anyway. Additionally, if Shannon ever did want to come forward and speak about her experiences, she would not be able to do so. Perhaps this is for the best, so that she can truly move on from this traumatic experience. Shannon's grandparents did recently give a photograph of her to reporters as she's turning into a beautiful young lady. They do not have any contact with each other, however. This last part is what I truly want you to take away from this story. Craig was arrested for child pornography and sentenced to 20 weeks in prison. He did not actually serve any of this time after he was convicted, as he was let off with time served. Michael and Karen Matthews were both sentenced to eight years, but only served four. All three of these people were found guilty of crimes against young children, but not one spent a decade behind bars. They are all out in the world and free to have more kids if they wanted to. Some people believe that Karen was a psychopath, that she had no care for her daughter's well-being. This would explain her ability to switch the tears on and off whenever she wanted. But if that's the case, what is to stop her from doing something like this again? How is it that she serves so little time when it will be Shannon that has the lasting effects forever? There must be something wrong with our jury system 
to let people like this walk freely among us while their victims stay in hiding forever. So guys, that was the story of the disappearance or fake kidnapping of Shannon Matthews. Let me know in the comment section what you guys think of this case. And as always, if you enjoyed this video, please give it a big thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. And I will see you all next time on another video. So take care. Bye!